What this is usually we interview uh, one of the top executives in the industry, and we're fortunate to have Mike Legan, the CEO of Spark Networks. But it, it, it's rare, by the way, to have Spark speak at this event. The last time Spark spoke at this event was in 2005. So yeah, it's a decade since we had Spark speak at this conference. So we're honored to have you here. And uh, Mark will probably go with a bunch of questions, and then we'll open up the audience for questions. As I said, I want to get you guys out of here at 5.15, so there's a big clock right there. And uh, I'll let, I want to leave it to, uh, uh, to Mark and I'd like to leave it to both of them. Great, Michael. So first of all, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, I don't know if that makes me a sucker. Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we did have some tough questions. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, you know, I think there is a, I've got a thesis about the stock. Effect. Um, since the push on Christian Mingle, and I just, just wanted to highlight that thesis, because I, I, can't, I, I think this is a sector that is fairly misunderstood, and I think it's a sector, I think Spark Networks has a company which was generally off the radar as most investors, and I think I got a thesis that when you started advertising, when predecessors started advertising, Christian Mingle was so uh, vastly and throwing a lot of money into building that critical mass of users of Chris, Chris and Neil, that had a lifting effect on the stock. And I think that's kind of landed it on the radar of a lot of people that might not have normally seen it, and that, that's had quite a lift effect. And I think we've seen some correction as those, those, uh, those people have left to some extent, and now the stock seems stable, and uh, I just want to talk to that at all. Is that, is that a silly thesis, or is it? No, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. So, so generally speaking, if you think about subscription businesses, um, if, if you look at businesses like Salesforce.com or Amazon is the classic example, right? They can run in the red for many years, and yet their valuation is huge because there's this expectation at some point you pull back the investment, and all of a sudden there's this huge cash uh, flow coming in, in through the business. And I think, generally speaking, with Spark, that was the concept that was out there from an investment thesis. Uh, of course, in the dating game, uh, you know, the, the life of a customer is quite short uh, relative to, for instance, a Amazon Prime subscriber or a Salesforce.com subscriber. Uh, and you're constantly having to fill the funnel back again. Uh, and, and when, so the, the, the general story over the last 15 months is that the the board of directors of Spark was voted out completely, and a brand new board came in. Um, we sort of un, you know looked under the hood and recognized that it was actually that thesis was completely incorrect. That the incremental value of these customers that they were acquiring was less than the cost to acquire the customer, uh, which you can't do. Uh, even when you pull back your marketing spend dramatically, they disappear quickly, and now you're left with nothing. And so that's, I think, when that recognition came in, the stock came down and, and things like that. But the Christian uh, segment is vast. I mean, the, the moment you segment, I can completely understand why you want to chase that down strategically. It's not an error, that's a very good strategy. Yeah. strategy. Um, so just in general, you think, what's your, your view now on niche dating? Yeah, so I, I think I'm probably a little bit biased because I've come from a niche background. I, I, previous, so I joined Spark a year ago. Uh, previous to that, I was with another company that for seven years that focused on niche businesses. And so I'm a big proponent of the value of the niche, which provides a, um, an immediate connection with others as they step onto that site, uh, but also it allows some protection because you don't need as large of a network to be, to be relevant and valuable. Um, and, and I think when you look at Spark, especially Spark is really two different key niches. The vast majority of our business is JDate and Christian Mingle. JDate has been around for 18 years, very stable business, um, and, and yet it's, it's, it's a really small business relative to Match or uh, OkCupid or Tinder or things. I mean, there's 12 million Jews in the world, right? We, we're not going to create a massively huge network effect. Um, but because it's niche focused and it's satisfying a, a core need of that niche, it has this longevity associated with it. Uh, and so I think that there's value there in, in, in the niche. It, I'm fascinated with the JSON swipe story. Yeah. Um, 
So I understand you bought it for on the order of $7 million. Yeah. And <clears throat> you did it in a very cheeky manner. Tell us more about that. Well, you say cheeky, but actually, uh, <laughs> there, there, so uh, it, it evolved this way. Um, J Swipe came out, they came out with uh, two things that we felt were infringing of our intellectual property. One was the name itself. Uh, J plus a, a, um, a synonym for dating, which we felt swipe had become literally a dating synonym. Uh, and there was, and we, we literally saw massive confusion in the market uh, with people thinking that J Swipe was part of our company. So there was concern around that. They also utilized technology, which we had a patent on. Uh, and so we rightfully wanted to defend that intellectual property. Now, as we went through the dialogue, we recognized that actually the, the consumer base that JSwipe was targeting and had, had gained traction in was very complementary to JDate. Uh, JDate, which has been around, as, as I said, for a long time, our user base is sort of 35 years old and up. It's, it's a much more serious, slightly older crowd. JSwipe, 90% of their users are under 30. Uh, and, and as we started talking about it, it was, it was much better to not provide a whole bunch of money to the legal system and rather to provide it to each other and start to build value for our, our company. So, so we joined forces. Very wise, great. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about Crosspoint. Yeah, so as, as we were, um, let me back up a little bit. So Spark, um, this last year has been really a, pretty much a turnaround situation. Uh, as we stepped into 2015, as I came on board, as the new, new board of directors came on board, uh, it was recognized, and, and it should have been recognized a long time before, that mobile was sort of an important part of our industry. Uh, Spark Network had no mobile capabilities whatsoever. The platforms were very old, uh, and there was actually no ability to drive mobile users. And so 2015, a lot of our effort was about building out mobile capabilities. Um, we've done that for our core applications, J8 and Christian Mingle, but we also wanted to do it for, we recognized that we were missing this whole millennial sector of, of the um, environment, and that's really exploded over the last couple of years, and so we wanted to build that out. We were actually on the path of launching a competitor to JSwipe, uh, um, uh, but we recognized that was so silly because JSwipe already had a good section of the market, so it was better to take the risk out of that. But what we've done is launched a very similar application within the Christian community. Um, we, talked, we went out and talked to a lot of millennial, uh, millennials who are devout in their Christianity, uh, and, and the, the classic line that came back to me was, yeah, I'm on Tinder, but I, I feel guilty with every swipe. Uh, and it just doesn't feel right, right? It's, just, it's, not, it's not aligned with how I'm thinking about dating. And so we've built out a, 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 a mobile application called CrossPass. Um, it's, it's very similar. It's a very simple swipe application. But the community itself is about Christianity and, and your level of devoutness within Christianity. And we've built that into the, the algorithm and, and things like that. Um, and it's gone very well. We just launched it a couple months ago in Los Angeles, and we've got uh, we're, we've just reached slightly over twenty thousand monthly active users just in the LA area. So it's, it's a it's a good thing. Great, congratulations. Yeah. The um, Spark app. You've done something quite innovative with the way that you're presenting the profile. It's a new Spark app. You've got two profiles that come up, and you choose one between two. Can you walk us through the psychology of that? What, what, what's yeah, the number yeah of I mean, generally speaking, um, well, choose two slightly stories. So one, Spark app was really an experiment for us to start to think mobile first. Uh, and so we challenged the team to get a mobile app out there. But as they thought about it, they wanted to differentiate from Tinder. And there's all this various spin-offs of the swipe. Um, but what you often find is the swipe just becomes rote. Mm -hmm. and, and you're just going, and you're just swiping, and, and you're just going, going, going. You don't actually put a ton of thought into it. And what we wanted to do was to slow people down and actually have them consider the options. And in order to do that, we said, okay, you've got a choice, top or bottom. Uh, you've got two people here, make a choice. Um, now, you can decide to, the easy way out is say, skip. Uh, and both disappear, um, but you only get a certain amount of those. Uh, and, and so you, you eventually have to make a choice. Um, and, and it's sort of probably part of a little bit of our DNA at Spark, which is we're a more serious, we, we want to be on the more serious end of the spectrum, period. And so we, we're used to having people 
really make considered choices when they're, when they're looking at somebody on, on the dating application. Uh, and we wanted to apply that within a, a very simple mobile uh, environment. And so let's lead on from that. I mean, you've got a certain philosophy for matchmaking. So what, how would you define, how would you describe the philosophy of the Spark Network expansion? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, um, I'll, I'll be the first to admit our matchmaking technology is really rudimentary. Um, we, we've never, the, the company has never really put a lot of effort into the science of matchmaking and algorithms and things like that. I think, generally speaking, the niche itself provides a lot of that um, compatibility aspects. So as you step in to, you know, you sign up for a Jewish dating app, you sort of know you're going to meet Jews. And, and that's the purpose why you're there. Uh, and so that helps a lot. Um, now, what we want to do is, is uh, and, and I think some others have done this quite well, and, and you talked about it earlier this morning, is about not just rely on what people say, but start to integrate the actions of, of the users uh, within the application to help provide better uh, feedback mechanisms. Um, but we're not there yet. That, that, that'll be a big challenge for us in the, in the coming months here. So you're a year into working in the industry. Yeah. And what's your thoughts on the, um, the health, the future of the industry at this stage? Yeah, it's... it's um, uh, you know, I think generally speaking, so it, 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 when, when, they, uh, when they asked me to take this job, I was like, man, I, I've been married 18 years. I, I, I don't know anything about dating. I missed that whole thing. You know, the internet wasn't around. Uh, they're like, don't worry, you'll get it, you'll get it. Uh, um, but at, but what's, there, there's two things that are sort of fascinating to me. One is, um, and, and something that really powers, I think, probably everybody in this room, but certainly everybody in our office, is this concept of really actually providing fundamental value to the human being, uh, to our customer set. It, it's really inspiring to be able to, and especially because we're at that serious end, we get feedback every single day of people thanking us for helping them, helping them find their, the love of their life, which is really empowering and, and very motivating. I think the other incredibly challenging thing, I think in this industry, probably more rapidly than almost in any other industry, is the challenge of free. If, if my competition is free, how do I run my business, right? And, and I think that will have, it, it's going to have really massive implications with our industry, and I think we're just starting to see that. Um, I think it's been a little bit of a, uh, a free-for-all, that's, that's a bad term, uh, a, a bubble of investment into the industry with the expectation that there would be monetization at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just not clear that that's going to happen. Uh, and so it, it creates this incredibly challenging environment for somebody who, especially as a public company, having to run a business and keep paying people uh, when all my competition is free. Uh, and how do you, it, 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 but it's a good challenge in many ways because we have to provide value. I, we're, we're, uh, I'm of the opinion that if I can continue to provide really solid value to my customers and help them find the love of their life, they will be willing to pay me something for that. Uh, I hope that remains true as all the millennials who've gotten used to swiping for free grow up and want to get a little bit more serious with their dating. I hope they continue to think in that way, but we're sort of, we're, it's, a, it's still unknown, period. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a fellow who's been investing quite a lot in the stock networks recently. Osborne, we know, around, around about 11% of the ownership of the stock. There's also a fellow called Lloyd Miller. Who is Lloyd Miller? Uh, yeah, Lloyd, Lloyd is, um, uh, he's, he's, a, he's an investor that, that focuses on small cap companies. Um, just. Uh, Funny story, so I, uh, the reason why I got this job was that we had a, uh, a group of activist shareholders who saw what was happening with Spark Networks, decided they, they weren't really happy with how that was working. They, they had a proxy battle, voted out the board of directors, put in a new board of directors. I came in, I, I got a call about six weeks into the job from a gentleman who said, hi, I'm Lloyd Miller, CFO. Uh, Lloyd Miller would like to talk with you. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And then, so I'm quickly Googling Lloyd Miller. Um, and I find that he's this activist shareholder uh, who's, who's taken a lot of sort of very activist positions. I'm just like, damn, what the heck did I do to screw up this quickly? I've been on the for six weeks. How could that, why is this guy going to come after me? Uh, but 
generally speaking, he, he had been following the whole process. Um, and he, he takes positions in small cap companies that he believes have really solid brands and solid sort of fundamentals from the business standpoint and is a, is a very patient investor. And so over the course of this year, he's been slowly buying, buying shares of stock. Okay. Um, how can other dating sites work with Spark Networks? Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, you know, in some way that we're in competition. Uh, but uh, the other great thing about this industry, it's not zero sum. Uh, we know that almost everybody is on multiple sites, and so there's there's value to being out there and exposed to to different audiences. Um, we're always looking for new members. Um, there's probably there's there's certainly members that we do not monetize, and so there may be uh, traffic trades and things like that. But I think in a in a more sort of um, Higher level, we believe that there is massive opportunity within the industry to consolidate. Uh, we are in an industry where nobody owns a majority position. Uh, there is thousands of little uh, applications and, and businesses out there. Ultimately, you have to have scale both in your network as well as your operation, operational infrastructure. To uh, and once you do, you can start to really make very nice profits. Uh, in this industry, and so we are looking to be one of those players who can consolidate. Um, and so there's there's probably lots of different ways. So let's put some trend lines on that. I mean, my, my general idea is that to the, the buyers in the industry want to be able to order of three to six times EBITDA. I hate the general rule of thumb of EBITDA. It's not accurate. There's so many more elements to it, but it is a good first rule of thumb. Um, and I think sellers want to sell somewhere between eight to twelve times EBITDA, and that's the range you need. Yeah. <laughs> so. So how do you, uh, what would you say is a healthy valuation? How would you value a dating company? Say if they're flat, showing signs of potential growth, you could fold in and have some economies of scale. Yeah, I think, I think there's probably a couple of different models. I mean, we've, we've talked, I get calls all the day from small people who are just on this sort of meteoric rise or believe that they will be on a meteoric rise and they think that they should be, they should be valued like Tinder. And I, I, I just say, you know, come back to me when you're, uh, you know the size of Tinder, well, you know whatever. Um, I think really where you start to consolidate is when you have a business model that's been proven out. Uh, you are generating revenues. You are able to show that you can generate those revenues with a, uh, a solid gross margin. Maybe you you know you're just barely eking out a uh, your EBITDA level, your profit line because of your operational structure. But there's some overlap, some synergies with operation that can be taken care of through a consolidation. Um, then, then it's about it's about what you're interested in, in walking away with, right? Um, in, in my previous job at, at a company called Internet Brands, I did about 60 deals, and and it was all there was always different reasons, and and uh, sometimes you are an entrepreneur who is just a serial entrepreneur, and you just want to get enough money to start the next thing and, and keep building up. Uh, other times, this is your baby, um, but you've been at it for. 15 years and you're just exhausted. Um, other times it's your baby and you can't let go, but you need liquidity and you need some some uh, combination of things. And all those things lead to different valuations and price conversations. And you know, generally speaking, you can always find some way to derive the value. So, for instance, with JSwipe, you know, they're on this meteoric rise. And and to be honest, if it wasn't a strategic fit for us, we wouldn't have done it because it doesn't make sense from, from day one, the price that they wanted doesn't make sense. Um, but we've structured in such a way with an earnout that uh, they are totally incented to not just grow the application, but to monetize that application, to try to prove that out. And if they do so successfully, not only do they make a lot of money, but it becomes an incredibly profitable deal for us because they're, they're, they're incentivized on EBITDA. And it's not just traffic growth or revenue growth or, or you know, things like that. It's actually pure value to the, to the company that we, you know, the acquiring company. And so there's always ways to structure deals. Uh, it, I, I've never actually done a deal where it's the same exact thing as some other deal. It, you always have to nuance it to the, to the situation. Great. So I'll make sure you get a chance to ask some questions. I'm going to run the mic. If you've got questions, please put your hand up. You. Name and company, please. Hi, uh, Alex. Uh, um, how much 
much uh, screening or verification do you do of your members' profiles? Yeah, so, so that's actually something that we feel we are really dominant in, and it's a very important aspect to our service, that we've done a very poor job of explaining to our customers. Because we run faith-based community right value structure, so we look at every single written profile, we look at every single photograph uh, on a human basis before they go live. Um, we've also implemented technology uh, that helps us with uh, fraudulent credit card transactions and all that kind of stuff, which is which can be more automated. Um, but but we have very strict moderation guides and, and teams that focus on that. So that you know, and for instance, the the photography rules on JDate are very different than Christian Mickle. Uh, there's there's just levels of tolerance that can be had in, in those two different faiths. Uh, and so, so we take that into consideration. It's a big part of our, our business. Thank you. Any more? Any more? Easy crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as you rightly mentioned, there's so many dating apps uh, which are coming up as well. How do you stand out? How do you, how do you make the differentiation? Because the same guy is actually using all four or all five in a market. But still, you need to make that differentiation to have a good revenue model to get some revenue out of it. Yeah, and I think that's where the importance of the niche is, right? Because uh, if you if you can build a community that <coughs> shares some critical component, then you can stand out, and and there's roles to be the dominant player there. Now, excuse me, niches are very there's there's a whole bunch of niches. You know, uh, uh, Kelly talked about the bacon lovers niche. I personally think that it's important to have a niche that is totally focused on the, that, that question of compatibility. What drives compatibility in a true relationship, in, in a long-standing, healthy relationship? Whether or not you like bacon is not going to last very long in your, in your relationship as a compatibility factor. But whether or not you go to church twice a week and believe that the Bible is the, is the, you know, is the true word of God, that will have a fundamental impact on how you live your life. And so you want to be compared, you want to be paired with somebody who is compatible in that, in that, in that way. That's why the niche can become quite um, powerful in creating a differentiating factor. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of apps out there who have tweaked the, the application of how you interact in some small way. And to me, that doesn't really differentiate the power of the community that you're actually working in within the application itself. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to be fair. Oh. Hi, I'm Damona Hoffman. Hi. And I'm a dating coach and also a TV host for. Josh. It's not on. I didn't think so. I can hear you. You turned it off. Sorry. No. Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm Devon Hoffman, and I'm a certified dating coach, and also the host of a dating show on the FYI Network. It's on tonight, ten fifteen. Um, and I also started out actually as a JMAC writer, and I was told a couple months ago that the format was changing, and you guys were moving into J Life, and it was going to be more of a lifestyle magazine. And then I was also told that you guys were doing away with your your outside bloggers. So I'm curious if you still see that as a um, an, um, an online community or magazine that you're looking to grow. If that's if that's parallel with JDA or something. Yeah, like yeah. So so what happened? Essentially, in a lot of aspects of Spark, because it's been around so long, a lot there was a lot of organic evolution of things, and and when you have that happening, you get a lot of redundancies oftentimes because you start down this path and it ends up looking exactly like this other path that you went down 15 years before, uh, and so we had a we had a J blog and a J mag um, as part of J date. And, and we, I, when I walked in, I was like, what's the difference? And nobody could explain to me what the difference was. And so we consolidated that into what we call J-Life uh, with a new you know, sort of look and feel. Um, we actually do have outside bloggers, so I'm not sure where we, and we can get you back in there. Um, uh, but, but the concept of um, what we actually found is that that community aspect is a really important part to our two big core brands. People actually come to us not just for dating, but actually to be part of that community. Um, and, and so having, having content um, is an important part of that. Hi, my name is Catherine uh, Dumas. Uh, 
I work for a company that developed an API uh, for a personality test. Uh, the question I have for you, you were talking about the fact that your company uh, is fighting off uh, the competition of free service. Yep. Mark has been saying repetitively over the week uh, that your website, not your personally, but online website, are leaving a lot of money on the table. What are you seeing as innovative new ways to capture money and increase your revenue uh, that way? Yeah, I, I think generally speaking, there's this, um, it's interesting when you, and, and we probably have some folks in here as well, that. At one end of the spectrum, you've got matchmaking, and, you, and, and matchmaking or the matchmakers are working with individuals who are willing to pay a lot of money uh, for that personal service. Mm -hmm. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got free mobile apps, Tinder and others, that people are not willing to pay a cent for. Uh, mm -hmm. And you say, well, how, how can you, how, how do you sort of work through this ladder of opportunity, and how do you start to segment users at their different levels of willingness to pay? Uh, based off of whatever their circumstances. Um, we sort of sit right probably at the lower end when, as, as a subscription model business, you know, we're $30 a month. That's, that's nothing compared to a $5,000 matchmaking. But we see this opportunity to start to provide higher levels of slightly personalized services or hand that person off to others that provide more personalized services so that you can actually match the service to the person um, and their willingness to invest in, in what they're looking for. Um, I, I'm a firm believer because of our scale that we need to think about scaled <coughs> solutions. Uh, and so building out a individual matchmaker service is not interesting to me because I don't know how to scale it. I'm not smart enough to figure that one out. Um, but what I can figure out is other sort of coaching capabilities that allow people to buy in to more mass scaled solutions that, that provide them with advice. So I think there's, I think there's um, by understanding that, not only do you take the money from the table and, yeah. and just divvy it in the right way, you, that, that way you get used to, you get use of all that, that uh, available opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Brian Brotman. Uh, how, how do you be an acquirer when you have some pretty large shareholders that think your stock is pretty cheap, and it's kind of like a chicken or the egg problem. You know, you think acquisitions would um, increase the value of your stock price and thus your currency, but you kind of don't want to give away maybe what your investors think is really cheap stock. Yeah. So, so the good thing you're you're right in most situations. Um, the uh, the one advantage that we have is that we actually are very tightly held. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, just on my board, I have 50% of the stock represented. Um, and, and I can actually count on my two hands almost the rest of the 50% of the stock. Uh, and, and so, um, we have very good connections with our shareholders. They recognize the, the opportunity there. And, and with the right opportunity, if that's the right allocation of capital, they're willing to allocate in that way. So normally if you had a, a, a very wide base and you thought your stock was very undervalued, you wouldn't want to use that as a currency. In this situation, if, if we think it's the right opportunity, then I, I have a direct line of communication and they can say yes or no. Cool. Okay. Mike Levy, you're the CEO of Spot Networks. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much.